Hello, I'm Jennifer Jankowskis, Curator of Art at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. Thank you for joining us today. We're so thrilled to be opening up an exhibition called Once and Again, Still Lifes by Beth Lippman. And today, joining me is the artist Beth Lippman. The exhibition features 15 recent pieces, all created within the last five years. They are both sculptural installations and photographs, and address a multiple of themes and different processes. So Beth, how are you doing today? I'm fine, Jennifer. Good to be here with you. Well, we've just finished up a pretty intensive installation of your work. This is the first time that you've had this many pieces in an exhibition all together, especially because they're works that you've been creating over a span of time. So how does it yeah. feel to bring together all of these different works? Well, it feels, I mean, of course it feels fantastic. I had. Um, I had kind of notions of what it would be like to see everything together, but um, until you're really standing in the room and you start to see the relationship between the different objects and the photographs, I didn't really get a clear sense of exactly what that relationship would be, but now I feel like it's a very strong kind of dialogue between the objects. So, um, yeah, I think it feels great. I'm also tired, but <laughs> that's, <laughs> you know. Well, it's, it's, it's yeah. an intense process. Yeah. Um, as we were putting it together, it was fascinating to watch you place each of these installations together because they're made up of hundreds of individual pieces mm -hmm. and then they create singular installations, but you can't just put them up one at a time. You have to kind of toggle between the different works. Can you talk about that process sure. of putting them together? Sure. And in some ways it really mimics the process in my studio because mm -hmm. I have four or five pieces going on in my studio at any one given time. Um, I work in a fairly additive process, I would say, so as opposed to a subtractive process where you're taking a huge block of marble, for instance, mm -hmm. and chipping away at that or grinding away at that to come down to a you know reductive form, essentially, um, or finding form in a large mass. I am creating multiple components and building, building, building. Mm -hmm. So um, mysteriously, it always takes far more than I think it's going to, uh, whether it's in my studio or there are, it's a static amount that goes into an installation like mm -hmm. once and again, but um, I, it's, it behooves me to, to work on multiple pieces at a time in my studio because I kind of make moments and then I have to mm -hmm. step back take the time, think about the composition, what it needs next. A lot of times I'm just waiting <laughs> to mm -hmm. see what it needs. It's not clear to me at that time. So um, in, in the studio, it's, it's a little different, but it's a similar uh, kind of rhythm and pace in mm -hmm. terms of creating something. And in this case, in Once and Again, um, it took about a week for the installation simply because uh, I use a variety of different adhesives, and I use a temporary adhesive, silicone, um, just like what you can get at the hardware store, and it takes a certain curing time, so I place things, let that cure, add over those things that I've glued, let that cure, so mm -hmm. it really makes sense to work on you know, seven sculptures at one time as opposed to starting and ending a moment, starting and ending a moment. So you're constantly toggling back and forth mm -hmm. between the compositions. I think you, you just mentioned something that's really interesting to me, and that is that you're working additively, you're gathering materials, you're creating things, and then it's coming together as you're composing the work. So does that mean you don't really have a really drawn out picture of what you want it to be and it's just coming together. You have sort of a sketchier idea of what you want it to be. How, how does that composition come together mm -hmm. in your studio? Usually I, ha I have a general direction or idea that I would like to research with tangible objects. Mm -hmm. um, I occasionally make sketches just so that I can communicate if it's a commission with a private individual or an institution and I have to really explain what's going on inside my thought process, then I'll do a sketch of what something might end up looking like. Mm -hmm. um, but primarily these pieces are three-dimensional drawings. So it doesn't really behoove me to make an entire complete drawing on a piece of paper and then 
just execute that drawing mm -hmm. three-dimensionally with glass because mm -hmm. it takes a lot of the mystery away and a lot of the discovery process um, in the creative practice. So I have a, usually have a general direction, like Picture with Vine mm -hmm. um, is a piece where I knew that I wanted the vine to kind of creep up and over um, these cultural objects, and the vine is referring to kudzu, which mm -hmm. I know I know everyone in Alabama knows about that plant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, I mean, I, I find the way that that changes landscape and the, the kind of imbalance of that invasive species and the fact that it was introduced by humans mm -hmm. um, for a greater good that has now become, uh, you know, something that is completely imbalanced in the environment. Um, well, that was a little tangent, but anyway, <laughs> you know, I knew that that vine wanted to creep over cultural objects, mm -hmm. which um, there's some parallels there between natural abundance or excess and cultural objects mm -hmm. in still lives mm -hmm. and, and the excess there. So instead of doing a full drawing of what that, might pe that piece might look like, I really let the vine kind of dictate how it was going to creep up and over the objects mm -hmm. and started with the objects um, and the composition of the objects and then integrated the, the vine kind of simultaneously. Mm -hmm. So each piece um, develops in its, in its own way with its own rhythms, mm -hmm. which is, is fascinating because that changes over time as mm -hmm. well. You know, it's, the way you talk about that piece makes me think of what's inherent in a lot of your work, and that's that duality. You know, there's that abundance and excess, but then you're using things that are often broken and shattered and allude to decay and, mm -hmm. you know, so you're really commenting on where we are in a society that is very consumerist in nature, I think, mm -hmm. but also tying it back to other eras and seeping your work in a lot of research. Can, can you talk a little bit about the duality in your work in terms of sort of the beautiful and not so beautiful underside of mm -hmm. what, you're, mm -hmm. what you're presenting and those ideas? Mm -hmm. Well, I think the material itself is just inherently really beautiful. If mm -hmm. we're talking about the glass sculptures, I mean, it's, some, the, it's very ephemeral. It is fragile by nature, but it's also very strong, which I think a lot of people are not necessarily aware of. Anyone who's dropped a piece of glass on the floor and it's bounced and not mm -hmm. broken, you know, understands what I'm talking about. Um, the history of art as a decorative material and a functional material is really interesting to me as well. So I think um, I, what I try to do is I really try to accentuate the the kind of darker qualities of the material, mm -hmm. uh, so to speak, not just black glass, but literally, you know, the fact that it breaks, the fact that it can cut you, the fact that it's, um, you know, it is a, um, a metaphor for the life cycle mm -hmm. in many ways. It's something that's kind of immediate when you work with it in, in the hot form and then becomes very um, rigid and kind of cool um, and, and concrete um, mm -hmm. afterwards, and but then it can break as we all get, you know, sick or we have illness, and then it can be mended, mm -hmm. or it can be thrown out. You know, so it's like this. It's a really interesting, an interesting material mm -hmm. in, in that way. And so I, I definitely um, continue to work with that material because of the inherent inherent dualities mm -hmm. that you find I in the material. Um, also, it's not really been considered an art form until very recently. Um, it was considered a mere decorative art uh, material right. or something that was purely functional mm -hmm. for a long time. Um, and so when I include broken things, like today someone asked, is that supposed to be broken? I was like, it's absolutely supposed to be broken. Mm -hmm. we're, you know, we're at a place where if you're walking into a museum and you see something on the floor, you see something that's broken, and it's within a composition, you can pretty much be sure mm -hmm. that that is a part of that composition. It's sometimes, Yeah. And sometimes I feel like it almost releases energy in the material. I, I literally break the things in my studio. It's very gratifying, actually, <laughs> to <laughs> drop things or to take a hammer and mm -hmm. really just go at something and, and break it or be very strategic in the way that it breaks. So, um well, speaking yeah. of breakage, I think this kind of leads me to think 
a little bit about some of the photographs that we have featured in the exhibition, mm -hmm. because I know part of your process is to create these really, you know, luxurious, rich glass objects, and then you capture them in a photograph, but then destroy mm -hmm. those original objects so they only exist then in two dimensions. And in a way, you're returning that back to mm -hmm. that still life tradition that, of painting mm -hmm. and capturing three dimensional objects in two dimensions. Mm -hmm. But I do find it fascinating that you then you know, destroy those glass pieces. Mm -hmm. That impetus came from um, actually responding to uh, the commercial market mm -hmm. um, for specifically art made from glass. Um, and, you know, my, I love my grandmother, who's still alive. Unbelievably, but um, she, you know, at one point when I started making those photographs, she said, "Why would anyone want the photographs mm -hmm. when you can have the glass?" Yes. <laughs> you know, and it's yeah. obvious, like yes, but that's the whole point. It is the removal of what you desire, and the paintings, the history of still life, mm -hmm. um, the paintings were all about that. They were all about this representation of what you desire, not mm -hmm. necessarily what you own. And also, in the case of the paintings, which I think is fascinating, you may find that there's, you know, eight disparate things in a painting, like a lobster, a lemon, a chalice, mm -hmm. um, a pipe, you know, all of these things. Well, the common consumer would not necessarily have access to those things mm -hmm. in the Dutch golden era. There would be no way to get shellfish and exotic, what, you know, pineapples and citrus were exotic mm -hmm. at that time. I mean, it was, they were actually fantastical paintings. They right. were not, um, they were not really reflections of what you surrounded yourself But they were also with. loaded with messages because all of yes. those objects contained symbolism. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, Paintings were directed at certain kind of viewers. They either had religious tones or, you know, moral exactly. tones or were for the wealthy and would depict those kind of luxurious items. And I think that your still life compositions have really captured that and that timeless quality of that symbolism that is still readable today. You know, most people may not know the nitty gritty details that a lemon means, you know, um, fertility, absolutely, or, but yeah. it's still yeah. an important aspect of your work, and yeah. um, that is commenting on what's happening in our culture today. But I think it's interesting that you are continuing to explore that symbolism, and but you're doing it in a way with objects that are timeless. You're not looking at things that are very specific to the period we're living in right now, but will still be meaningful, you know, 100 years from now and were meaningful 200 years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know, right? Well, because that's we're, true. You we're don't know the future. In an age, <laughs> we're living in an age where technology is changing so mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. um, but I think you I don't mentioned include this, any technology. I don't include, I don't include technology mm -hmm. because, as we know, you know, our phone is now old, right. even though I bought it yesterday. <laughs> yeah. I need a new one because it's totally old and outdated. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I it's a very, um, that is a little bit of a trap to include um, very of the moment technology because it's changing before our eyes. Although you and I have talked about this before, but mm -hmm. ironically, I mean, I still read books. Mm -hmm. I still read so hard, I. hard copy right. and I, and it does something different to my brain than when I'm listening to a book, which I also do, or reading something on a computer. Um, and now books are really a symbol of the past in mm -hmm. some ways to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, if you know, that's mm -hmm. something to consider as well. But I do, I do try to shy away from anything that would become dated mm -hmm. within my lifetime for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, we're, it's a very fundamental thing. I mean, I approach still life through this idea of the fact that we all need food. Mm -hmm. um, and many of the objects in still lives or depicted in still lives are um, edible objects. So mm -hmm. that was kind of the segue in that brought me into it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's something that's just universal to humans. Like mm -hmm. We all really need to eat. <laughs> and then there's all these layers of of desire 
consumption and consequence around eating if mm -hmm. you have food issues or if um, if you're talking about hunger world mm -hmm. hunger or specific hung you know I mean or desire as a metaphor for mm -hmm. other things desire for objects even which is a, a kind of hunger or mm -hmm. the religion of consumerism in that way so it's all I think very um, related and relevant to the society that we're living in now even though it is universal and was extremely relevant mm -hmm. in the Dutch Golden Era when the still life tradition began mm -hmm. and I think you know this but I'll just point it out again um, that era was the first time that we were living in an age of excess mm -hmm. with food uh, production so mm -hmm. it was the first time that people there there, there was a, an abundance of food people mm -hmm. could um, you know, they could purchase more than what they needed to eat. Mm -hmm. So it did become more of a representation of um, of, of of wealth and and success in that way. Mm -hmm. It wasn't such a, a meager existence. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I find it fascinating looking at the works that are in the exhibition, and that we've been talking quite a bit about still lifes, but your still lifes are now incorporating other themes and other elements, including portraiture. Mm -hmm. You're bringing in the landscape. Mm -hmm. I think you started bringing in the landscape in 2010, and we certainly talked about that mm -hmm. with the kudzu and Picture with Vine, but there's also still life with kudzu. You're seeing that in one and others. So there's mm -hmm. a number of pieces that really incorporate that, both within the exhibition mm -hmm. and other works that you've created. And you're pushing that even further by bringing all three elements together mm -hmm. in your newest series of photographs, which were part of a residency that you did last year in Alaska. Correct, yeah. I did a residency at, at the Chalitna Lodge Wilderness Retreat in Lake Clark, Alaska, and I had never been to Alaska mm -hmm. before. And prior to going up to that residency, I made um, glass objects and I shipped them up to this lodge retreat area that is, it takes uh, th three planes mm -hmm. to get to <laughs> this particular remote lodge and mm -hmm. a boat ride, a half hour boat ride. So it's, it's pretty remote. Mm -hmm. um, so the shipping of that work was not a small thing. It was a miracle actually that, that it got there in some ways. Um, so when I arrived there, I spent a lot of time making photograph like still lives essentially on plein air mm -hmm. uh, which is is really um, a term that is reserved primarily for painting mm -hmm. outside in the elements but I created uh, compositions with backdrops and gazing balls mm -hmm. um, directly on site in marshes beaver dam areas um, on the lake um, yeah in, in areas that I could access and sang to the bears in a loud voice mm. as I was taking photographs <laughs> rather quickly as well <laughs> because it, it was interesting because it was uh, you really felt the pre you felt your vulnerability as a human mm -hmm. in that space but I was thinking about those objects as surrogates for individuals at that point where in particular the gazing balls mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. because the, the history of gazing ball is really it's pretty wonderful but mm -hmm. It, and it does have theological roots, but it also, I think of it more as almost a human condition. It's like the all, it's the all-knowing eye, but it's, you know, it does stand in for your view. Mm -hmm. um, you're also looking at the photograph through the lens of the camera, so there's mm -hmm. all of these dualities and kind of um, layers of, of sight Mm -hmm. and and perception and witnessing in that so they're still lives mm -hmm. but the objects are also portraits which really go back to really like fundamental roots of research and material culture mm -hmm. um, which every object is reflective of who we are as a person and the greater society and then they are also landscapes mm -hmm. because you're seeing the landscape reflected back into in that mirrored globe mm -hmm. um, so I I feel like it brought together a lot of interests in different areas that I've had over a long period of time. And with this series, it's the first time you're actually incorporating color in any way, because when you're working with glass, you're only using clear glass or black glass. 
and now you've got color mm -hmm. in your work. Mm -hmm. How has that been for you transitioning into to doing that? And what are some of the reasons why you haven't used color before? And what does mm -hmm. the clear glass mean to you? And mm -hmm. what does the black glass mm -hmm. mean to you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I never thought about it. Like, I'm going to use color now. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't like, because also when you're seeing through the clear glass, you're also seeing all of the colors mm -hmm. in the environment around the clear glass. So in some ways, you're redefining your environment, you know, that you're seeing through the glass, mm -hmm. you're seeing it reflected through the glass, you're seeing any nuance of, of light color mm -hmm. coming through the glass. So I never, ironically, weirdly, I don't really think of my work having an absence of color mm -hmm. because also the, the thickness of the glass, the kind of glass co um, changes the color as well. And mm -hmm. it's subtle, but it's there. Um, but I don't use colored glass, mm -hmm. which is specifically, I think, what you're talking about. Right, that's true. Primarily because um, of it, because the material itself is so rooted in the decorative arts mm -hmm. that I find that color to to be just it's it it stand it's another layer that stands between you mm -hmm. and your ability to understand the composition. And then have that composition literally feed back into your own memory banks mm -hmm. and your own your own subconscious. So I'm really dealing more with form mm -hmm. and the idea or the essence of objects mm -hmm. more than uh, uh, I mean things are representational. But if I actually made a pair that had color that mimicked mm -hmm. a real pair, mm -hmm. it almost stops it. your yeah. it stops your understanding and that form becomes concrete mm -hmm. and it becomes its own thing whereas if you can see through something or you're having light refracted back at you mm -hmm. it's always elusive and it's always giving you hints of information that mm -hmm. are are kind of it's almost like you have to puzzle it out and right. figure it out and, and come back into that composition. So I find it very useful to not use color. I think it really allows for more mystery mm -hmm. and the, the ephemeral quality of the material. Mm -hmm. In terms of the black glass, I, I it, ironically, I kind of use the, use the black glass in a similar way because it's so inky and dark mm -hmm. and not, um, you almost can't, you know, a lot of times, of course, you can make out the form, but then you're moving the lights reflected back, and it becomes a silhouette that's very mm -hmm. much about this. Um, and once again, an inability to kind of own what that object is in mm -hmm. some weird way, and it also refers specifically um, for me to this idea of uh, like more decorative mourning devices. Mm -hmm. That's I was looking at Victorian. Um, decorative culture and domestic mm -hmm. material culture um, and and still do yeah often well and I think about the whatnots which mm -hmm. I know that the furniture that you had made for it is in direct reference to you know French furniture um, at the etages is that what they're called they were really they're um, <laughs> I mean and th that came around mm -hmm. the Victorian era right or were they a little later th that the Victorian era is a little bit later than that than that mm -hmm. period, but there was this whole um, focus on on um, displaying your material objects. Mm -hmm. The 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 closer you came to having a perfect interior reflected as close as you came mm -hmm. to to godliness and spiritual kind of a spiritual uh, purity. Mm -hmm. So. Objects meant something very different to the Victorians. So yeah. you would place all of all of your very carefully kind of acquired objects in essentially a later version of a curio cabinet right. or a curiosity cabinet, which is from a wonder comer that would come earlier. Right. But and and um, they're they're just such wonderful comments on how people collect objects mm -hmm. and how they try to represent themselves mm -hmm. through objects. And I think that looking at the whatnots, people are going to find so many things that they can kind of identify that they may have in their mm -hmm. own homes. Mm -hmm. But um, I think that that's true for all of your works, that there's so much that people can identify with when they're looking at them and take so much 
back. And I hope they will come in to see the exhibition. Mm -hmm. It's up through uh, January 31st at the Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts. It will then travel to the Hunter Museum of American Art. And it will then go to the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee. We thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you.